leader of the government. I'll wait for Senator Wong. It's really up to you, Lindsay. Honourable Senators, I've received a proclamation summoning the Parliament in the following terms. I, General the Honourable David Hurley, AC, DSC, retired, Governor-General of the Commonwealth of Australia, acting under Section 5 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia, appoint Tuesday, 26 July 2022 at 10.30am as the day and time for the Parliament to meet at Parliament House to hold a session of the Parliament. And I summon all senators and members of the House of Representatives to meet at that day, time and place. Signed and sealed with the Great Seal of Australia on 20 June 2022, David Hurley, Governor-General, countersigned by His Excellency's Excellence Command, Anthony Albanese, Prime Minister. Honourable Senators, the Deputy of His Excellency, the Governor-General and the Honourable Justice Gagler. Honourable Senators, please take your places. Black Rod, please let the members of the House of Representatives know that I desire their attendance in the Senate.
Senators, members of the House of Representatives, His Excellency the Governor-General has appointed me as his deputy to declare open the Parliament of the Commonwealth. The Clerk of the Senate will now read the instrument of appointment. Appointment of a deputy to the Governor-General to declare open the Parliament. I, General the Honourable David Hurley, AC, DSC, retired, Governor-General of the Commonwealth of Australia, acting under section 126 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia and Clause 4 of the Letters Patent, dated 21 August 2008, relating to the Office of Governor-General, appoint the Honourable Susan Mary Kiefel, AC, Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, to be my deputy to declare open the Parliament of the Commonwealth at the time and place appointed by the proclamation published in the Commonwealth of Australia Gazette on 21 June 2022. Dated 7 July 2022, David Hurley, Governor-General. Countersigned by His Excellency's Command, Anthony Albanese, Prime Minister. Pursuant to the instrument which the clerk has now read, I declare open the 47th Parliament of the Commonwealth. His Excellency the Governor-General has commanded me to let you know that after the Senators and Members of the House of Representatives have been sworn, the Governor-General will declare in person at this place the cause of his calling the Parliament together. Before that time, it is necessary for the Senate to choose its President and for the House of Representatives to choose its Speaker. Later today, you will present those you have chosen to the Governor-General. The Honourable Justice Gagela will now attend in the House of Representatives to administer the oath or affirmation of allegiance to honourable members of that House. Honourable Senators, His Excellency the Governor-General has authorised me to administer the oath or affirmation of allegiance to Senators elected on 21 May 2022, as required by Section 42 of the Constitution. I call the Clerk to read the Commission. Authority to administer the oath or affirmation of allegiance to Senators. I, General the Honourable David Hurley, AC, DSC, retired, Governor-General of the Commonwealth of Australia, 
acting under section 42 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Australia, authorise the Honourable Susan Mary Kiefel, AC, Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, to administer the oath or affirmation of allegiance to senators. Dated 20 June 2022, David Hurley, Governor-General. Countersigned by His Excellency's Command, Anthony Albanese, Prime Minister. I called the clerk to table the certificates of election. I table the certificates of election of senators elected on 21 May 2022. I inform the Senate that Senators Stirl and Thorpe, who are named as elected on the certificates of election, are unavoidably absent from the Senate today and will be sworn in on a subsequent day. Will honourable senators please come to the table as their names are called to make and subscribe the oath or affirmation of allegiance? Will the following senators representing New South Wales please come to the table? Maurice Payne, yeah. Deborah O'Neill, yeah. Ross Cadell, yeah. Jenny McAllister, yeah. David Shoebridge, yeah. Andrew Molan. Will those senators making oaths please take your Bible in your right hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, Senators, please sign the test roll and the senators' roll. I return to your places. Will the following senators representing Queensland please come to the table? James McGrath, yeah. Murray Watt, yeah. Matthew Canavan, yeah. Penny Allman Payne, yeah. Pauline Hanson, yeah. Anthony Chisholm. Yeah. It may not be in order. Well done. Will those senators making oaths? Would you like to get your Bible, Senator? Will those senators making oaths please take your Bible in your right hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, James McGrath, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, and her heirs and successors, according to law. So help me God. Senators, please sign the test roll and the senator's roll.
Which one's mine? Down here? Yeah. Senators. Will the following senators representing South Australia please come to the table? Simon Birmingham, yeah. Penny Wong, yeah. Andrew McLaughlin, yeah. Don Farrell, yeah. Barbara Pocock, yeah. Karen Little. Will those senators making oaths please take your Bible in an available hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, Penny Solomon, do swear that I will be faithful and true allegiance to the majesty and the heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. Senators, please sign the test roll and the senators' roll. Representing Tasmania, please come to the table. John O'Dunian, yeah. Anne Urquhart, yeah. Peter Wish Wilson, yeah. Helen Polly, yeah. Wendy Askew, yeah. Tammy Tyrrell. Will those senators making oaths please take your Bible in your right hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, Jenny Askew, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the majesty of Queen Elizabeth II, the heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. Senators, please sign the test roll and the senators' roll.
that's a small oversight, sorry. Right? Thank you, Senators. Will the following Senators representing Victoria please come to the table? Sarah Henderson, yeah. Linda White, yeah. Bridget McKenzie, yeah. Jana Stewart, yeah. Ralph Babette. Yeah. Will those senators making oaths please take the Bible in your right hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, Sarah Henderson, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. Senators, please sign the test roll and the senators' roll. <laughs> Sign somebody else's. Thank you, Senators. Will the following Senators representing Western Australia please come to the table? Sue Lyons, Michaelia Cash, yeah. Dean Smith, yeah. Dorinda Cox, yeah. Fatima Payman. Will those Senators making oaths please take your Bible or Quran in your right hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, I do solemnly swear and affirm and declare true allegiance to the Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors and successors of the Lord, so help me God. So God. God. Senators, please sign the test roll and the senators' roll. I know, it's the same two lefties. The only part of me that's pending. Thank you, Senators. Will the following Senators please come to the table? Representing the Australian Capital Territory, Katie Gallagher, David Pocock, 
representing the Northern Territory, Malindiri McCarthy, Jacinta Nampet, Jimpa Price. Yeah. Nearly got it. Nearly got it. Will those senators making oaths please take the Bible in your right hand? Senators, please recite the oath or affirmation of allegiance now. I, Sign the test roll and the senator's roll. Thank you, Senators. You may resume your places. Senator Watt. Thank you, Clark. Noting that the office of the President has become vacant, I move that Senator Lyons take the chair of the Senate as President. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there any further nominations? Senator Waters. I move that First Nations woman Green Senator Dorinda Cox take the chair of the Senate as President. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There being two nominations, unless there are any further nominations, there being two nominations, I invite Senator Hanson. Glenn Stirl. In order to do that, because the standing orders require that uh, you nominate a senator who is present. But thank you. Um, I invite the two candidates to address the Senate. Senator Lyons. Thank you, uh, Clark and uh, Senators. I'm seeking your support today to be the President of the Senate, and if you bestow that honour on me, I will certainly carry out my jobs, uh, the job of President, the role of President, in an impartial way. I have had a long apprenticeship as Deputy, so most of you I know, and I look forward to getting the new Senators, and uh, I look forward to you putting your uh, trust and support in me. Thank you. Senator Cox. I submit myself to the will of the Senate. Uh, never in this country's colonised history has a First Nations person ever been appointed as the President of the Senate. At a time when more First Nations representation is here in the 47th Parliament than ever before, it's now our chance to take that further step and realise the full ambition of our First Nations parliamentarians. In May, across this country, Australians told us that they wish to see a different parliament. They made it clear that their parliamentarians don't just talk about their communities, but they should also look like them, they should sound like them, and they should be from those communities. This morning, each of you were welcome to country, and with an expectation that we will actually set ourselves on the right path and begin a new legacy together. 
of truth-telling, accountability, of treaty and of justice. I thank the Australian Greens party room for this important and very history-making nomination, and I thank you all for your support. A ballot will now be held uh, to elect a president. Before proceeding to a ballot, the bells will be rung for four minutes. Senators, the Senate will now proceed to a ballot. Please write on the ballot paper the name of the candidate you wish to vote for. Uh, the candidates are Senator Lyons and Senator Cox.
If all senators have voted, the ballot papers will now be collected. Showing you the open. I just double check senators have all senators returned their ballot papers. Thank you. I invite Senator Urquhart and Senator McKim to act as scrutineers.
Order. Senators, I announce the result of the ballot as follows. Informal, two votes. Senator Cox, 12 votes. Senator Lyons, 54 votes. Yeah. Order, order. Senator Lyons is therefore elected President of the Senate in accordance with the standing orders. You escorted. Thank you very much, Senators, for the honour and privilege bestowed on me here today. I'll do my utmost to be a fair and consultative president. I want to acknowledge uh, outgoing President um, Senator Slade Brockman and thank him for being collegiate and for including me in lots of uh, his duties. And, um, I wish him well and I look forward to working in a similar man manner with the deputy. Thank you, Senator Cox, for the participation in the ballot today. It is always good to see democratic processes in place, um, and I thank all senators uh, for that honour today of um, electing me as the president. Senator Wong. Thank you, President, and I rise on behalf of the government to congratulate you on your election as president of the Senate. Uh, and at the outset, I note the long-standing convention that the government of the day has the right to nominate the president of the Senate, and I thank the chamber for its continued respect of this convention. Uh, in, in making this nomination, the government has nominated a senator uh, who is appropriately qualified and suited to the significant responsibility that comes with occupying the chair of the Senate as president. As people know, Senator Lyons has served the chamber since 2013 as deputy president and chair of committee since 2016. And I have no, no doubt that her experience over these terms will serve her well as she takes on this responsibility. I also make the point about the operation of the convention and the operation of this chamber. This can be a partisan place. We've all been part of that. Uh, but I always regard it as a matter of pride that in this place, uh, these elections, uh, certainly between the parties of government, uh, observe some of the principles that I think matter to our Westminster system. Uh, and uh, both parties of government have always ensured that the party, notwithstanding that neither of us ever has the numbers in our own right, except on one occasion since I've been here, um, always observes um, the, its obligation to the system and to, to the conventions which underpin it, so I thank the Senate. I make another point. Um, I was elected, it is quite a long time ago now, um, as my people keep reminding me, um, <coughs> uh, and I remember the first Senate president um, that I served under uh, was Margaret Reid, uh, and she was uh, the first woman uh, to uh, serve as Senate president, I think between 1996 and 2002, and I acknowledge that it was the coalition who nominated um, uh, uh, the first woman. Um, she held respect and support of all senators, and I'm confident Senator Lyons will do so, uh, and will expect be able to expect the same across the Senate. Uh, and I am uh, very pleased that we see it's taken a long time, uh, but I'm pleased that we see yet another woman serving in this high office. I'm confident Senator Lyons will represent the interests of the Senate and the Parliament as a whole, uh, particularly when it comes to matters of privilege. I'm confident she will join her predecessors as a principal defender of the role and authority of the Senate in relation to the other place. So on behalf of the government, I congratulate you, Senator Lyons. President, we wish you every success in this most important of roles. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. And I congratulate you on your election to this very important office within this chamber as President of the Senate. And in doing so, I also acknowledge the long-standing convention in the Senate uh, that uh, the role of uh, the parties of government uh, to nominate uh, the president of the Senate, and I congratulate you on being the nominee uh, of the government uh, and with that enjoying the support uh, of both the government and the opposition to take uh, this place. Uh, I acknowledge uh, particularly the role of former president, Senator Slade Brockman, and thank Senator Brockman for his all too short service in the chair. Uh, but acknowledge that during that time he discharged his duties 
with nothing but professionalism, uh, fairness and diligence, uh, and working cooperatively with you then as Deputy President, uh, as his distinguished predecessor, Senator Scott Ryan, had equally done so. Uh, it is indeed a long period of service that you held as Deputy President that brings you President to this chair with much knowledge and experience of the procedures, processes of the chamber and the other important functions and roles of president uh, that you will now discharge. You do so at a time of a new government, a new parliament and a new Senate. And with that, it's important that all of us remember the very special responsibilities that fall upon you as president uh, to this Senate and to all senators in the fulfilling of those duties to ensure the proper functioning of this chamber uh, to ensure that the dignity of this chamber is upheld. These are duties in, that also fall upon each and every one of us in our conduct that we bring to this place, and I hope that all senators will work to make sure that you, the deputy, uh, and those who hold the chair from time to time uh, are all supported so much as possible in that role. It is also important that the role provide every opportunity for each senator to advance their issues of concern, uh, for each senator uh, to be freely able to debate, to challenge and to contest ideas across this chamber, to scrutinise the government of the day within the full limits of the standing orders and to have the freedom and opportunity to be able to do so. We wish you well uh, in your service. Uh, we acknowledge indeed uh, that you follow in a long line of uh, successful presidents uh, and the particular role as the first woman uh, to hold this office from the Australian Labor Party. Uh, following Senator Margaret Reid, uh, who had such distinguished service uh, as a Liberal senator in this place and as president. Uh, in wishing you success, we offer you our support for the office, uh, for you to be a strong, fair and independent presiding officer in this place. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Birmingham. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. On behalf of the Australian Greens, we offer you our congratulations for fulfilling the role um, of President of the Senate. And, um, we uh, look forward to a very productive parliament. We are, of course, saddened that our magnificent First Nations woman, Senator Dorinda Cox, is not uh, sitting up there. And we hope that as the chamber continues to become more diverse, that some of these conventions uh, that support the two-party system can also uh, diversify and evolve. And uh, we look forward to a parliament that truly represents the community, uh, including the echelons of those uh, decision-making roles. But we give our heartfelt congratulations to you and particularly recognise you as the first Labor woman um, to fill that chair. And we wish you all the best and we hope that this parliament can address the challenges that the nation faces. Thank you, Senator Waters. If there are no further speakers, the Senate will now suspend. Oh, beg your pardon, I call Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, President. I wish to inform senators that the Governor-General would be pleased to receive the President and senators in the Members' Hall at 2.30 p.m. Thank you, Senator Wong, and I think it's now appropriate for me to suspend the Senate. <laughs> thank you, senators. I've got my pink plate. Thank you. Thank you.
Honourable Senators, the President. Senator Wong. Thank you, President. The President, the Governor General will be pleased to receive you and Senators in the Members' Hall immediately. I invite Senators to accompany me to the Members' Hall. The sitting of the Senate is suspended until the ringing of the bells at approximately 2.55 p.m. Honourable Senators, the President. <laughs> Honourable Senators, his Excellency, the Governor-General. Honourable Senators, please be seated. Blackrod, please let the members of the House of Representatives know that I desire their attendance in the Senate.
Honourable Senators and members of the Parliament of Australia, I'll begin by acknowledging that we are meeting today on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. Pay respects to elders past and present and particularly acknowledge the younger generation who are our pathway to our future. Since I last spoke in this chamber, ferocious fires, devastating floods and a once in a hundred years pandemic has unleashed an extraordinary period of uncertainty, trauma and loss upon our country. The past three years have asked so much of so many. Again and again, Australians have risen to the moment, thinking of their communities, looking after each other. In hard times, Australians have been at their caring and courageous best. Major challenges, new and old, are before us. In confronting these challenges, this parliament must seek to match the resolve and resilience of the people in whose name you serve. As the Prime Minister has said, prove worthy of the people of Australia. In a turbulent world, we can find hope in the strength of our democracy. In May, at more than 7,000 polling centres, many thousands of post boxes, by the phone and in diplomatic missions the world over, millions of Australians cast their balance and exercise their fundamental right and responsibility as citizens of our great democracy. Australians have elected one of the most diverse parliaments in the history of our federation. And for the first time in almost a decade, Australians voted to change the government. All of us can give thanks that changes of government take place peacefully and swiftly in Australia, and with respect and courtesy for those with whom we may not agree. The new government has pledged to govern for all Australians, whoever they are, wherever they live and whoever they voted for, and to honour the trust Australians have conferred. The government knows this country faces serious and pressing challenges. The rising cost of living, low wages growth, climate change and its devastating impact, tensions in the region, uncertainty in the world, pressure in health and aged care, and an economy in need of cheaper energy and new skills. The government is determined to tackle these challenges in a spirit of unity and togetherness, as well as urgency. It does not want to waste a single day. To this end, the Prime Minister and a select few ministers were at Government House to be sworn in less than 48 hours after the election result was known sooner than any other new government in Australia's history. The government's commitment to hit the ground running was honoured with the Quad Leaders meeting in Tokyo and a Prime Ministerial visit to Indonesia. The government made a submission to the Fair Work Commission to prevent Australia's lowest paid workers from going backward, resulting in a 5.2 per cent wage increase. The government also submitted a new, more ambitious 2030 nationally determined contribution to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, committed to reduce emissions to 43 per cent below 2005 levels by 2030, putting Australia on track to achieve net zero by 2050. Beyond that, the government has already taken measures to shore up Australia's energy market, protect aged care residents and provide assistance to Australians affected by the recent floods. The Uluru Statement from the Heart. The government takes office with a renewed ambition for Australia to reconcile with our past, to tell and know the truth about history, and to place a First Nations voice at the heart of our democratic process. The Uluru Statement from the Heart was an act of generosity by First Nations people, mapping out a path forward for us as a nation. It is the government's intention to take up this generous offer and to seek to enshrine a voice to parliament in the constitution via a national referendum in this term. The government views the implementation of the Uluru Statement as an opportunity for healing and for learning from the truth of our history. And just as importantly, the voice is a chance to build a better future for First Nations people. A future where a voice to parliament helps drive and deliver better health outcomes and longer lives, new education and employment opportunities, 
safer communities with decent housing and an end to the cycle of injustice, incarceration and death in custody. All of this, voice, truth, treaty and closing the gap depend on genuine partnerships. The government commits to engage closely and respectfully with First Nations people and the Australian community more broadly ahead of the referendum. Honourable Senators and Members, a First Nations voice promised to be, like the 67 referendum, like Mabo, like the National Apology, a defining moment for our nation. An historic opportunity to move on from the safety of words to the bravery of action. At the centre of the government's determination to close the gap is the belief that First Nations people, like every other Australian, should be made to feel empowered. To this end, the Community Development Program, Compulsory Income Management and the Cashless Debit Card will all cease. In their place will be policies that provide First Nations people with greater support to secure good jobs and earn proper wages in safe conditions. In the same spirit, the government will invest in First Nations management of lands and waters, humbly recognising the skills and knowledge gained over tens of thousands of years. The government will expand the community-led model of justice reinvestment to turn the tide on incarceration and act on the national shame of First Nations deaths in custody. It will partner with communities, peak bodies and elders to improve health and life expectancy. And the government will commit to new Indigenous employment targets for the public service and for Australia's 200 largest companies. I congratulate the Honourable Linda Burney MP, member for Barton and a proud member of the Wiradjuri Nation on her appointment as the Minister for Indigenous Australians. I also congratulate Senator Malandiri McCarthy, a proud Yanuwa woman, on her appointment as Assistant Minister for Indigenous Australians and Indigenous Health. And Set Senator Pat Dodson, a proud Yaru man, on his appointment as Special Envoy for Reconciliation and the implementation of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I wish them all the best as they lead this urgent and historic work, work which will promote unity and healing. A stronger economy. Helping Australians, all Australians, achieve their aspirations in life is central to the government's values of opportunity, fairness and reward for effort. The government's policies will promote economic growth that create opportunities for Australians and the government's policies will create opportunities for more Australians to drive economic growth. At the macro level, the Australian economy faces a number of significant challenges. Disrupted supply chains mean it's harder and more expensive for Australian businesses and households to buy the goods they want and need. Rising interest rates are increasing pressure on mortgages and a decade of low wages has put a handbrake on confidence. We are, in the words of the Treasurer, in choppy waters. But the government is determined to steer Australia safely through. The government will make targeted investments that expand the capacity of the economy, reduce debt as a share of GDP over time and improve quality of life for Australians. Prioritising spending that achieves the greatest economic benefit is the most efficient way. Spending that creates jobs, boosts participation, lifts productivity, increases wages and grows incomes. The government will invest in cleaner and cheaper energy, better training of our workforce, cheaper childcare and an upgraded NBN. Importantly, the government will focus on the quality of spending, not just the quantity. This includes ensuring multinational companies pay their fair share of tax. Childcare. The government recognises that the rising costs of childcare are a pressure point for family budgets and a continuing drag on the economic participation and productivity. To honour a key election commitment, the government will reduce childcare costs for more than a million families. The government will also instruct the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission to design a price regulation mechanism to drive down out-of-pocket costs. The Productivity Commission will undertake a comprehensive review of the childcare sector with the aim of implementing a universal subsidy for all families. This will be accompanied by a whole-of-government 
early years strategy focused on the well-being, education and development of Australia's children. The ultimate goal is to add affordable childcare to the list of universal services alongside Medicare, the NDIS and superannuation that Australians cherish. Investing in cheaper childcare reflects the government's belief that one of the most powerful initiatives it can pursue for stronger economic growth and greater productivity is more equal opportunity for women. This is why the government has set itself a goal to re-establish Australia as a global leader in gender equality. A new national strategy to achieve gender equality will be developed, geared at closing the gender pay gap and improving women's economic equality, health and well-being. An independent women's economic security task force will also come into force to deliver gender responsive budgeting and embed gender analysis in the policy development process. The government will seek to strengthen the ability of the Fair Work Commission to support wage growth in female dominated industries such as aged care. The recommendations of the Human Rights Commission's landmark Respect at Work report will be implemented, including, crucially, a positive duty on employers to create safe workplaces for women free from harassment. The government has plans to help end violence against women and children, including finalising the next National Action Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children 2022-32. The government will establish 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave, increase the supply of emergency housing for women and children fleeing family violence, and invest in more caseworkers to assist women leaving violent situations. A fair go at work. One of this government's central aims is building an economy that works for people, not the other way around. An economy where working hard means Australians can pay their bills, support their families and save for the future. Today, more than 1.3 million Australians are either unemployed or looking for more hours, and many more struggle on low wages and with poor working conditions. The government knows Australia can do better than this. The nature of work has changed enormously, with an increase in new work arrangements and the gig economy. The government will seek to ensure that Australia's laws catch up with this reality and protect people from exploitation and unsafe working conditions. The government will make secure work an objective in the Fair Work Act, and it will legislate to make wage theft a crime. Skills. For the government and for the business community of Australia, Skills are high on the national agenda. In the coming period, the government will legislate to establish Jobs and Skills Australia to drive vocational education and training and strengthen workforce planning. The new body will bring employers, trade unions and the training and education sector around the same table to achieve common objectives. The Commonwealth will help train thousands of new workers by ensuring that one in ten workers on major government projects is an apprentice, trainee or cadet. Public TAFE will be returned to the centre of Australia's training system and the government will support fee-free TAFE places for Australian students, focused on those studying in industries with a skills shortage. There will also be up to 20,000 more university places, with priority going to universities offering places in priority areas like clean energy, advanced manufacturing, health and education. Action will also be taken to reduce the number of hand, on hand visa applications to address skill shortages in the short term. In the same way, the government will work with Australia's agricultural sector to ensure farmers and producers can access workers at the right time while ensuring those workers see their rights upheld. The government believes that with the right settings, we can build a bigger, better trained and more productive workforce, boost incomes and living standards and create more opportunities for more Australians to get ahead. And to support these goals, the government will hold an Australian Jobs and Skills Summit on the 1st and 2nd of September here at Parliament House. The summit will bring businesses, trade unions, the non-government sector and all levels of government together to find common ground on the economic challenges we face. It will inform the development of an employment white paper, which will highlight the structural changes and opportunities in the Australian labour market 
and chart a path forward. A future made in Australia. At the election, the government signalled its strong belief that Australia must be a country that makes things. Australia has a proud history of manufacturing, but over recent decades, the scope of our manufacturing has narrowed as international competitors have displaced Australian makers and Australian skills. The supply chain issues experienced through the pandemic have put a spotlight on this challenge. The government will seek to rebuild Australia's proud manufacturing industry through a commitment to a future made in Australia. This begins with the establishment of a $15 billion national reconstruction fund to grow and diversify Australia's industrial base. The fund will take as its mission supporting new and emerging industries, helping our economy transition to reach net zero emissions by 2050, creating secure, well-paid jobs for Australian workers, driving regional economic development and building our sovereign capability. Priority areas for investment will include renewables and low emission technologies, medical science, transport, value add in agriculture, forestry and fisheries, value add in resources and finally defence and enabling capabilities. The Buy Australia Plan will complement this investment by maximising the use of Australian made goods, products and materials in, commerce in Commonwealth contracts, harnessing the significant purchasing power of government. The government will also work with industry to reach a goal of 1.2 million Australian tech related jobs by 2030. New investments will be made in the Australian railway industry too, ensuring that more trains are built in Australia by local Australian workers. Whether a train or a ferry, a solar panel or a piece of technical defence equipment, Australians will once again be making the products our economy needs for the future. Investing in infrastructure. The government believes revitalising Australian manufacturing is an investment in, a na in national resilience and national security. And the same is true for renewing and improving our national infrastructure. Infrastructure investment enables people and goods to move around faster, reducing the cost of doing business, growing the economy and better connecting our communities, improving Australians' quality of life. The government is resolved to restore confidence in Australia's infrastructure and regional development pipelines. At the centre of this effort will be reforming Infrastructure Australia as our nation's foremost infrastructure advisory body. The Commonwealth, in cooperation with state and territory governments, will focus on quality investments, including to improve safety, reduce congestion and boost productivity. The government will also begin work on nation-building projects like high-speed rail and an Australian flag strategic fleet. It will also ensure the inland rail project gets back on track. And as part of a new national push to improve road safety and lower the road toll, the government will work with truck drivers and the wider industry to upgrade rest areas on national roads. Medicare and the NDIS. The government believes every Australian has the right to access universal, affordable medical care. It is one of the things that underpins our unity as a nation. But for too many Australians, geography, income and background still pose barriers to care. The government is committed to making it easier for Australians to see a doctor and afford treatment. To serve this priority, at least 50 Medicare urgent care clinics will be established. Their services will be bulk billed. The government will deliver a $750 million strengthening Medicare fund with investment priorities guided by the Strengthening Medicare Task Force. The government will also cut the cost of medicines on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme from $42.50 to $30, saving Australians $12.50 for every medication. The 50 per cent loading for telehealth psychiatric consultations under the Medicare benefit schedule will be reinstated, allowing easier access to bulk build service for Australians who live in regional and rural areas. There will also be wider access to the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card opening up access to cheaper medicines and bulk bill doctor visits for an extra 50,000 older Australians. GPs will be able to access grants to modernise their practices, and the government will invest in initiatives to bring more doctors to regional and rural Australia. 
The government is committed to strengthening Medicare and is determined to fulfil the promise of the National Disability Insurance Scheme to empower Australians with disability, their families and carers. The wisdom, diverse experience and perspective of people with disability will be at the centre of the government's efforts to improve the design, delivery, accountability and sustainability of the NDIS. The government will also develop a national autism strategy and oversee the national disability data asset so we can better understand the life experiences of people with disability in Australia. The government believes the NDIS can and must work better for people with disability. COVID-19. As this winter brings a new Omicron wave, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to challenge virtually every facet of our healthcare system. The government will continue to adapt its response in line with the public health advice, including significant renewed efforts to increase the uptake of booster vaccines, influenza vaccines and COVID-19 treatments. The government will also extend the National Partnership on COVID-19 response for a further three months to the 31st of December 2022 at a cost of approximately $760 million. This will provide funding to states and territories to continue to care for those with COVID-19 and protect the community through the public health response. The government will also use this opportunity to better prepare for the future. It will establish a Centre for Disease Control to strengthen Australians' pandemic preparedness and ensure a nationally coordinated response to future outbreaks of infectious disease. Aged care. COVID-19 took a devastating toll on Australians in aged care, but the government recognises aged care was in crisis well before the pandemic struck. The Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety has challenged Australia to do better, far better. The government will legislate changes to deliver quality, security and dignity in care for every older Australian across our aged care system. This will mean a registered nurse on site in every aged care facility, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It will mandate for every Australian in aged care to receive 215 minutes of care per day, ensuring more care for every resident. It will deliver better food, an increase in transparency and accountability, and a cap on the fees people can be charged for administration and management of their home care package. The government will back calls for a real pay increase for aged care workers at the Fair Work Commission, recognising that higher standards of care must be supported by higher wages. The government sees a moral duty in caring for our elders and treating our older Australians with the respect, humanity and dignity they deserve. Climate change and energy. Acting on climate change is a priority for the government and an opportunity for Australia. Embracing the transition to clean energy will create hundreds of thousands of new jobs. Under its Powering Australian Plan, the government expects to create more than 600,000 job opportunities, with five out of every six in regional Australia. The plan will also spur $76 billion worth of investment and will help save families and businesses hundreds of dollars a year on their electricity bills. Powering Australia will create clean energy jobs and cut power costs. But it is also a plan to bring people together and move the country forward around a collective desire to take far stronger action on climate change and accelerate our efforts towards net zero emissions by 2050. Additionally, the government has formally updated Australia's nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement a 43 per cent reduction on 2005 levels by 2030. The government intends to go a step further, enshrining this new commitment in legislation and sending industry and investors a clear message, certainty. The government believes that with the right policies and investments, Australia can become a clean energy superpower. That's why the government will invest in accelerating the decarbonisation of Australia's electricity grid. The government will also support manufacturing of renewables and low emission technologies and invest in community batteries and solar banks. Australia's first national electric vehicle strategy will be established too. Investment in vehicle charging and hydrogen refuelling infrastructure will double. 
The government will establish a new energy skills program and train 10,000 new energy apprentices. The role of the Climate Change Authority will be restored. And to show the seriousness with which Australia approaches the climate change, Australia will seek our Pacific partners' views on co-hosting a future UN climate conference of the parties. Environment and water. The government believes that acting on climate change is a chance to grow the economy and protect the environment. The Great Barrier Reef is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and one of the seven wonders of the natural world. Protecting its future is an important responsibility. The government will invest in reef preservation and restoration, ensuring that the reef can be enjoyed for generations to come. The government will partner with local communities to clean up urban rivers and catchments, to improve water quality and amenity, and help protect threatened species. The government will double the number of rangers in the Indigenous Rangers Program, bringing the total number of rangers to 3,800 by 2030. And they will boost funding for the management of Indigenous protected areas, critical for maintaining cultural sites, biodiversity cons conservation and restoration. Furthermore, the government has committed to a full response to the SAMA review of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act and to ongoing consultation to make environmental laws work better for everyone. Water management is a priority too. The government will establish a national water commission to drive ongoing water reform and future-proof Australia's water supply. The government will also deliver on water commitments under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, including 450 gigalitres for South Australia. Disaster readiness. The government recognises the economic opportunity and the environmental necessity that acting on climate change presents for Australia. It also understands that the consequences of climate change are already being visited upon our communities with greater frequency and ferocity. The government will oversee an ongoing process of review to ensure Australia's national disaster recovery support arrangements are streamlined, fair and equitable. It will work with states, territories and local governments to continue to implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission into natural, national natural disaster arrangements. And it will build our national resilience, ensuring we have the capacity to predict, prevent, absorb, adapt to and evolve from national emergencies and disasters in the future, including through the Disaster Ready Fund. Australia's place in the world. This 47th Parliament of Australia meets in an international environment far less certain than any other time in recent memory. The Prime Minister earlier this month witnessed firsthand the devastation wrought by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As that unprovoked, illegal and immoral war continues to rage, the rules-based global order comes under increasing strain. The government will continue to show solidarity with the people of Ukraine and seek to manage the ripple effect of uncertainty in our own region. At this time, Australia needs to deploy all aspects of our power military, diplomatic, economic and social. The government believes the Australian people must be at the heart of our engagement because what we project to the world starts with who we are. Our multicultural society makes us a more diverse, more prosperous and more vibrant nation. But multiculturalism is also a diplomatic asset. As the home of more than 300 ancestries, Australia can reach into every corner of the world and say, we share common ground. We can work together with our partners to secure a region that is stable, prosper prosperous and respectful of sovereignty. We will deepen cooperation through ASEAN, strengthen our bilateral relationships and further our shared goals through the Quad. Australia will bring new energy and resources to the Pacific, respecting Pacific institutions and listening to Pacific priorities and the most pressing of which is the climate crisis. Ultimately, the government's foreign policy is an expression of our national values, national interests and national identity. An important part of that equation is trade. The government's objectives will be to advance Australia's interests, bolster the rules-based multilateral trading system 
and deliver business opportunities for Australian producers and suppliers. The government sees great gains for us in a future powered by cleaner and cheaper energy. So as the world demands a change, we need to not just diversify the markets we export to, but what we export as well. Turning to defence policy and national security, the government will spend 2 per cent of Australia's GDP on defence, including enhancing the Australian Defence Force with capabilities outlined in the 2020 Defence Strategic Update. AUKUS will remain central, not only in delivering nuclear-powered submarines, but also in guiding accelerated development of advanced defence capabilities where they have the most impact. A Defence Force posture review will similarly ensure the capability is there to meet Australia's growing strategic challenges. In 2022, national security also takes in everything from cyber security to biosecurity. The government will seek to bolster Australian cyber security expertise and has already acted to boost Australia's biosecurity system against the threat that foot and mouth disease poses to our farmers. Operation Sovereign's borders will be maintained to ensure people smugglers in the region cannot restart a business model built on human suffering. And the government will support a strong humanitarian migration program that can respond to humanitarian crises as they arise. Keeping the nation safe is the solemn duty of every government. And the government believes that the Australians who fulfil that responsibility and risk their lives in the service of our nation are owed not just respect and remembrance, but ongoing support. This is the moral obligation we owe ADF personnel, veterans and their families, including those affected by our longest and most recent war in Afghanistan. Priorities include speeding up DVA claims and payments processing times, and expanding the network of veterans and family hubs across Australia. The government has also listened to the families of defence personnel and veterans, and supported their calls for the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide, and we look forward to the Royal Commission's interim report next month. Safer and more affordable housing. Alongside the government's commitment to nation building sits a determination to ensure more Australians can count on the safety and stability of secure housing. We all know the difference a secure roof over your head can make to a person's life chances. The government will establish a Housing Australia Future Fund to build an additional 30,000 new social and affordable houses within five years. It will create a National Housing Supply and Affordability Council and launch a National Housing and Homelessness Plan. The government also sees the importance of home ownership and the sense of belonging, pride and stability it can confer. And so it will support more Australians into their own home through the Help Buy Scheme, Help to Buy Scheme and the Regional First Home Buyer Support Scheme. Education. The government believes education is the most powerful weapon against disadvantage and the best investment in Australia's economic future. Cheaper childcare means more children will get access to early years education. And the government will cooperate with the states and territories to make sure all schools are put on a path to full and fair funding. The government knows great teachers change lives and will initiate policies to attract the best and brightest to the teaching profession and work with schools across jurisdictions to address teacher workforce challenges. In addition, the government will prioritise helping kids bounce back after COVID-19 with a $200 million investment in mental health and wellbeing support. The government will boost investment in public TAFE and apprenticeships to ensure a new generation of Australians can gain the skills and competence for the jobs of the future. And resetting the relationships with universities is a priority too. The government has pledged to develop an Australian Universities Accord, covering the accessibility, affordability, quality and sustainability of our treasured higher education institutions. With that comes a renewed focus on university and research excellence, including the translation and commercialisation of great Australian ingenuity. Valuing the arts. The government has great faith in our national cultural endeavour and recognises the importance of getting Australians' arts industry back on track too. The conviction is simple, that a nation that invests in art and creativity is a nation that knows itself and invites the world to know it better. It's in this spirit 
that this parliamentary term will see the release of a national cultural policy, the first in almost a decade. There will also be greater certainty for two other vital cultural institutions, the ABC and SBS, with new funding terms spanning five years. <coughs> Fighting corruption. The government has an ambitious agenda for Australia, and it recognises that so much of what it hopes to achieve depends on the trust of Australian people. Trust that government and public institutions will act with integrity in the interests of the nation. To strengthen this trust, the government will legislate to create a powerful, independent and transparent National Anti-Corruption Commission. This will bring the Commonwealth in line with the states and territories and will enable investigations of serious and systemic corruption. It will be an important addition to the integrity framework of this country. And out of the same commitment to accountability and public confidence, the government will establish a Royal Commission into the scheme commonly known as robo-debt. A strong Australian public service. Leading with integrity also means working in partnership with a strong, committed and empowered public service. The removal of the average staffing level cap, rebalancing the use of labour hire, limiting fixed term contracts and undertaking a strategic reinvestment of funds will form the first phase of the government's plan to rebuild the public service capacity to deliver the best outcomes for the Australian people. The government will ensure the APS becomes a model employer and an employer of choice, including and especially for First Nations people and those living with disability. The government will seek to lead by example. In conclusion, a change of government represents a chance to bring the nation together anew. To senators and members from the government, opposition and crossbench, I congratulate you on being called to serve our country and our democracy. I urge you to advocate thoughtfully, debate respectfully and in everything you do prove worthy of the Australian people. I wish you every success in meeting this moment. It is now my duty and my honour to declare the 47th Parliament of the Commonwealth of Australia open. Thank you. We're just waiting until the House members depart and then we'll um, suspend the Senate. The sitting of the Senate is suspended until the ringing of the bells at approximately 5 p.m. Thank you.
Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou would be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled? Call the clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. <clears throat> I report that, accompanied by honourable senators this afternoon, I presented myself to the Governor General as the choice of the Senate as president. The Governor General presented me with a commission to administer to senators the oath or affirmation or allegiance. I table the commission. I inform the Senate that I have received a copy of the opening speech which His Excellency the Governor-General delivered to both Houses of Parliament. I call Senator Wong. I move that, the, that consideration of the speech be made an order of the day for the next sitting day. Uh, those in favour? Against? I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wong. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to Standing Order 3-4. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Wong. I thank the Senate and I move that Standing Order 3-4 be suspended to enable the Senate to consider business other than that of a formal character before the address and reply to the Governor-General's opening speech has been adopted. So the question is that motion is moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, I advise the Senate that following the election held on 21 May 2022, 2022, in which the Australian Labor Party was elected to government, the Governor-General commissioned the Prime Minister to form a government. Ministers and assistant ministers were appointed on 1 June 2022. For the information of senators, I table a list of the full ministry, which includes representation arrangements. Thank you. I also wish to inform the Senate that I have been appointed as Leader of the Government in the Senate and Senator Farrell has been appointed as the Deputy Leader of the Government in the Senator, Senate. Senator Gallagher has been appointed as Manager of Government Business in the Senate and Senator Chisholm will serve as the Deputy Manager of Government Business in the Senate. I also advise that Senator Urquhart has been elected as the Chief Government Whip in the Senate and Senators Ciccone and Pratt have both been elected as Deputy Government Whips in the Senate. I seek leave to have the ministry list incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Uh, I advise the Senate that following a meeting of the Liberal Party Senate party room, uh, I was elected uh, leader of the opposition in the Senate, uh, and I welcome the continuation uh, following her successful election of Senator Cash uh, as the coalition's deputy leader, uh, albeit on this side of the chamber. Um, I, uh, I acknowledge also the election of, uh, of Senator Bridget McKenzie, who continues in her role as Leader of the Nationals in the Senate, uh, and Senator Perrin Davey, uh, having been elected as Deputy Leader of the Nationals across the Parliament. Um, I further advise the Senate that Senator Wendy Askew has been elected as Chief Opposition Whip in the Senate, and I congratulate Senator Askew on her election, uh, along with that of Senator Scar and Senator O'Sullivan, who have both been elected Deputy Opposition Whips. Uh, I thank Senator Smith uh, for Senator Dean Smith, of course, for his service 
uh, as the government whip in the Senate uh, over a significant period of time since 2015 uh, and congratulate on him on his appointment uh, to the opposition front bench as Shadow Assistant Minister for Competition, Charities and Treasury. I inform the Senate that Senator Rustin uh, will serve as Manager of Opposition Business in the Senate uh, and Senator Dunningham will continue as, uh, as the deputy uh, to Senator Rustin in relation to the management of business. I congratulate uh, our senators on their various appointments uh, and do also thank Senators McGrath and Chandler for their service uh, as, uh, as deputy government whips at the time uh, in those parliamentary roles and congratulate them also on their shadow ministry appointments. President, I congratulate all senators on their appointment to this place uh, following uh, the election. Um, I particularly congratulate the three new coalition senators uh, who have joined our ranks, uh, albeit noting uh, the loss, sadly, of some of our colleagues. Uh, I offer my congratulations to government senators and particularly to those government senators who have been appointed uh, to uh, ministerial and assistant minister roles. It is a great honour uh, that those uh, on the other side have to be part of the Government of Australia and to be able to undertake those roles. I acknowledge Senator Wong uh, as Leader of the Government in the Senate, uh, returning uh, to ministerial role and to the other new ministers across this chamber. Uh, whilst we would have wished for an alternative election result on our side, we know that serving the people of Australia as part of a government is an enormous privilege uh, and we wish you well in doing so if not wishing you ongoing electoral success in the future. Um, uh, the Coalition uh, takes very seriously our role to be a responsible opposition working in this chamber uh, with the larger crossbench elected by the Australian people uh, to hold the government to account, to represent the views of our constituents, our communities and all Australians. We look forward to working in this chamber in a collegiate manner, respectfully in our differences, bipartisan where possible, in the national interest. Uh, but to demonstrating to the Australian people uh, that our values are the values of Australia and Australians. I thank the Senator. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Oh, sorry. And I should also hail our shadow ministerial arrangements. Uh, leave. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Waters. Thank you. Thanks, President. Uh, in relation to office holder arrangements for the Australian Greens, I advise the Senate that I continue as the Australian Greens leader in the Senate. I advise that Senator Maureen Faruqi has been elected as deputy leader of the party, uh, and Senator, Senator Lydia Thorpe is deputy leader in the Senate. I further advise that Senator Sarah Hanson Young is our manager of Greens business in the Senate, and Senator Nick McKim continues as our party whip. Uh, I congratulate all of the new senators and all of the office holders in other parties, and I seek leave to table the office holder list for the 47th Parliament and have it incorporated into Hansa. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Waters. Uh, Senator Hanson. To make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted uh, for two minutes. Just that I advise the Senate. I advise the Senate that I am leader and whip of Pauline Hanson's One Nation. Thank you, Senator Hanson. You didn't need leave for that. Um, Senator Lambie. Do you think the motion? No. Um, thank you, Madam President. I also make um, leave. I also seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Lambie. I advise that uh, I advise the Senate that Senator Tyrrell should be designated as a whip for the purposes of Standing Order 24A relating to the selection of bills committee. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, Senator Davey. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, I wish to advise the Senate that Senator Ross Cadell has been appointed the Nationals Whip in the Senate and uh, will also be um, appointed to the Selection of Bills Committee. Thank you, Senator Davey. I believe Senator Pocock was seeking the call. Senator we we'll have to call you Senator D. Pocock. Thank you. Thank you, President. I also seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I advise the Senate that I should be designated as whip for the purposes of Standing Order 24A relating to the section of Bills Committee. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Babette. I also seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. 
I advise the Senate that I should be designated as a whip for the purposes of Standing Order 24A relating to the selection of bills committee. Thank you, Senator Babette. I remind the Senate that it should now choose one of its members to be Deputy President and Chair of Committees. I call Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Uh, President, I, it gives me great pleasure to move that Senator Andrew McLaughlin be appointed Deputy President and Chair of Committees. Thank you. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters. Oh, I beg your pardon, Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I think you need to ask if there are any other nominations. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming you're standing to make one. Yes. Thank do you. I have the call? Yes. Thank you, President. Uh, with great pleasure, I move that Senator Jordan Steeljong take the chair as Deputy President and Chair of Committees. Thank you. Are there any further nominations? As there are no further nominations, we will now proceed to uh, the conducting a ballot. Um, so we'll invite the candidates. Uh, First of all, Senator McLaughlin to make a short statement. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, my fellow senators, I seek your support for election to the position of Deputy President. I ask senators to have, think of me kindly and have regard to my work as temporary chair and my work as a chair of other committees and very, uh, during my time in the Senate. And I hope that uh, when you turn your minds to this, it will be a testament to my dedication that I will bring to the role. Uh, if I am successful at ballot, uh, I will do all I can to support our president, who is a senator I hold in the highest regard. Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Senator Steele John. Thank you, uh, President. I come to the Senate today to seek your support to be elected into the position of Deputy President of the Senate. Uh, this role, if you were to support me in it, uh, would be a historic uh, moment uh, to elect a person who identifies uh, openly as a disabled person uh, into this role. The Deputy President of the Senate is a leadership role in this place. Appointing a disabled person into this position would send a very clear message to disabled people across the country, a message that disabled people belong in politics, a message that disabled people are able and are trusted to lead, a message that this government, the opposition and the newly appointed crossbench are committed to centering disabled people and, from day one, will waste no time in breaking down the structural ableism that disabled people experience each and every day as a result of the decisions made in this place. Now, I am proud to have the support of my Greens colleagues to put myself forward uh, for this position today. The Greens will always prioritise and promote upholding the voices of disabled people in this place. And I encourage every member of the Senate uh, to take this opportunity uh, to do the same. And you're the best candidate. Thank you, Senator Steele John. A ballot will now be held, but before proceeding to ballot, the bells will be rung for four minutes.
Lock the doors. Oh. The Senate will now proceed to ballot. Please write on the ballot paper the name of the candidate you wish to vote for. The candidates are Senator McLaughlin and Senator Steelejohn. If all senators have voted, the, the clerks will now collect up the ballot papers.
Senators Askew and McKim to act as scrutineers. Order. The result of the ballot is Senator McLaughlin 57 votes and Senator Steele John 13 votes. Uh, Senator McLaughlin is therefore elected Deputy President and Chair of Committees in accordance with standing orders. And I look forward to 
uh, working with you, Senator McLaughlin. And thank you. And um, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you. I, I just I would like to make, if I may, some brief remarks to congratulate uh, Senator McLaughlin on his election as Deputy President on behalf uh, of the government. Um, nearly, yes, I, I'm still having to get used to that. That might be a few faux pas for a little while. Um, I did note this morning, following the election of the president, um, the long-standing convention uh, as to the government of the day nominating the president and the uh, opposition of the day nominating the deputy president and chair of committees. So I just want to make a comment about that because there were a couple of interjections. It, it's, it's a reflection of the Westminster system. Yeah. It's a reflection that under our system, a party forms government, a party forms opposition, a party forms opposition. Um, uh, and if you know that somebody else formed a government or an opposition one day, the same convention presumably would apply. Uh, and uh, it reflects. It reflects. Order. Uh, well, the Order. Respectful debate on something where we, we're electing the deputy president. Uh, um, uh, uh, it is a reflection of a Westminster system, which, uh, in this chamber also recognises that no single party government, as I said, holds uh, the uh, um, majority uh, generally uh, in the chamber. Um, i make a couple of comments about Senator McLaughlin. Uh, he, he may have only served this chamber since 2020, but he has been a member of the Legislative Council in our home state of South Australia for some time prior to that. Um, and I do want to say, and this is no respect to you, President, that I'm delighted that another South Australian uh, is taking a leadership role in this place. Um, I note all. <laughs> I, oh, the Tasmanians have got the whip sewn up, though. Um, <clears throat> he, he's also served as president of the LegCo for a couple of years. Uh, for for a couple of years, so um, I think that uh, role, um, his experience in uh, presiding in that role, has been evident in his uh, work in this chamber. Uh, I look forward to working with you. Uh, I, uh, we hope you and the president will form uh, a very good team uh, in the way that we've seen uh, under previous presidents and deputy presidents um, the, uh, you know, a very, very collegiate approach uh, to the management of the chamber. Uh, and I look forward to your fair and inclusive chairing uh, continuing. Uh, the government congratulates you, Senator, Senator McLaughlin, and we wish you all the best in your role. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thank you, President, and uh, I rise to echo the remarks of, uh, of Senator Wong, who has indeed touched on the, uh, the many attributes that I'm sure Senator McLaughlin will bring to serving alongside you, President, as uh, as the Deputy President in this chamber. Uh, his experience stretches uh, far beyond uh, his service in this place, uh, which has been distinguished and active. Uh, but indeed it's an experience that does stretch, as Senator Wong has acknowledged, uh, into the South Australian Parliament uh, and to serve as a presiding officer uh, in that parliament. Uh, I know that he will uh, bring uh, a sense of duty uh, and, uh, and a commitment to uh, the impartiality of the chair uh, in working alongside you, uh, that he will work as diligently as possible in the different roles that you and he undertake, uh, particularly his roles in relation to Senate committees uh, and the chair of committees in this place. Uh, I thank the Senate for its support uh, of Senator McLaughlin uh, and the government for uh, its continued uh, recognition of the conventions of the Senate of this place, uh, of our system of government, uh, to which uh, we remain equally committed. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. Uh, the Greens rise, of course, to congratulate Senator McLaughlin on his appointment as Deputy President and Chair of Committees. Um, we're, of course, disappointed that our outstanding Senator Steele Jong, a, a, a proud disabled man, has not been successful in this role. It would have sent a really powerful message of inclusion um, to the entire community. Um, we also look forward to entering this century and becoming a republic. Thank you, Senator Waters. If there's no further speakers, Senator McLaughlin is seeking leave. Thank is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Thank you. I'd just like to quickly uh, thank my fellow senators for placing uh, trust in me. And I, and I undertake to you that I'll work faithfully and diligently to advance the interests of the Senate. Uh, Madam President, can I congratulate you on your election earlier today, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. 
There being no further speakers, um, we'll now move on um, to the appointment of temporary chairs of committee. So, pursuant to Standing Order 12, I table a warrant nominating senators, sorry, senators as temporary chairs of committees when the deputy president and chair of committees is absent. I'll now ask if there are any notices of motion to be given for another day. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the provisions of paragraph 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the following bills, allowing them to be considered during this period of sittings. The Aged Care and Other, Legisla other Legislation Amendment, Royal Commission Response Bill 2022, and Social Security and Other Legislation Amendment, Self-Employment Programs and Other Measures Bill 2022. I also table a statement of reasons justifying the need for the bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statements incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Um, we'll now move to leave of absence. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, President. I seek leave to move motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Uh, yes, you seek, well, sorry, you're seeking leave? I seek leave. Yes. yes, leave is granted, I believe. Yes, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators for personal reasons. Uh, Senator Green for today and Senator Stirl for the 26th and 27th of July. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Senator Askew. I seek leave to oh. move a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Hume for the 26th to the 28th of July 2022 for personal reasons. Thank you. And I'll just go back to Senator Urquhart. I need to move that. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. And their motion is moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Uh, leave is granted. Yes, leave is granted, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senators Faruqi and Thorpe for the 26th to the 28th of July this year for per personal reasons. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Oh. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the adjournment of the Senate today. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. I move that the Senate adjourn without debate today on the motion of a minister. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Oh. Oh. Senator Wong. Thank you, um, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former Prime Minister of Japan, Mr Abe Shinzo. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Wong. I thank the Senate and I move that the Senate records its deep sorrow at the death on 8 July 2022 of Abe Shinzo, the, largest, the longest serving Prime Minister of Japan, and places on record its acknowledgement of his role in the development of his nation and tenders its profound sympathy to his family and the people of Japan in their bereavement. President, on the 9th of 9th July, landmarks in my home state of South Australia were lit in red and white, the colours of Japan. Adelaide Oval, the South Australian Parliament, the Torrens Footbridge, along with the Sydney Opera House, the MCG and the Shrine of Remembr Remembrance in Melbourne, and many more around the country, all lit in solemn tribute to one of our nation's truest friends. It was a sign of the esteem in which former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was held across Australia, and I believe I speak on behalf of all Australians in expressing shock and grief at his terrible loss. And I express my deepest sympathies and those of the Australian people to Mrs Abe, Mr Abe's family and to the people of Japan. I echo Prime Minister Albanese's reflection of the bleak paradox that someone of such courage and strength of character could be taken away with an act of such cowardice. And I affirm the Prime Minister's vow that this low act of violence must not be allowed to overshadow a life that was lived to such high purpose. 
Mr Abe was the longest serving Prime Minister in Japanese history, but his contribution far surpassed the time he served. He was a political leader of consequence, who looked beyond election cycles and made a lasting difference. Transformative leaders are rare, Mr. but Mr Abe made Japan bigger in the world. He had a vision of a Japan that exercised a degree of influence in the world commensurate with its economic weight and cultural significance, and he helped Japan assume its proper place in the community of nations. Given our shared values and interests, this vision was also of great benefit to our country. Through his signature Abenomics agenda, Mr Abe sought to shape an enlightened activist role for government in stimulating economic growth. Tourism boomed, trade was liberalised, women were given greater incentives to enter into and stay in the workforce. Mr Abe also reformed Japan's security posture in ways that enabled Japan to play a greater role in upholding regional stability. And while these measures did not pass without some controversy in Japan, they were grounded in his conviction that Japan should be able to exercise the same rights as all other countries, such as the UN Charter's right to collective self-defence. His security and defence reforms enabled greater engagement and cooperation between the ADF and the Japan Self-Defence Forces. Japan is now Australia's closest defence partner in Asia. When he addressed the Australian Parliament in 2014, he spoke of his ambition for the relationship between Australia and Japan and how our two countries could work together to uphold peace and the rule of law in our region and beyond. He understood our partnership had been founded first on trade and investment, later complemented by our growing strategic and security cooperation and also growth in, in tourism, student exchanges and cooperation in the arts, culture, sport and research. It is a relationship between our two countries that is above politics, and I acknowledge the role of both parties of government in fostering that relationship. The deep affinity between our peoples has been a constant throughout, and I believe we all felt that affinity strongly in the presence of Mr Abe. His vision helped elevate our bilateral relationship to a special strategic partnership in 2014. He oversaw the signing of the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement the same year and gave impetus to negotiations towards our reciprocal access agreement signed in January of this year. Shinzo Abe was also a global leader, and he will be remembered as one of this century's most eminent political figures. It was during his first term that he revealed himself as a regional visionary, sowing the seeds of what would later become the concept of the Indo-Pacific in his speech on the confluence of the two seas at the Indian Parliament in 2007. Australia became the first country to formally adopt the Indo-Pacific as a regional frame of reference, in the Gillard, first in the Gillard government's 2013 defence white paper. And the concept came to define Japan's foreign policy under Mr Abe's second term, to shape the mission of the Quad and to frame the regional outlooks of the United States, ASEAN, European partners and others. And the elevation of the Quad in recent years owes so much to his energy and his statementship, as does the conclusion of the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Shinzo Abe was a leader in the G7 the G20 and the United Nations, championing a vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific and an international order governed by rules rather than power alone. And despite regretting how much he had left to accomplish by the time he retired due to ill health in September of 2020, Mr Abe had left a profound imprint on Japan and on the world. When he last visited the Australian Embassy in Tokyo in April this year, Mr Abe was as energetic and determined as ever to strengthen cooperation between Australia and Japan in the region and to see the free world combat Russia's aggression in Ukraine and to foster global peace and prosperity. These common values help explain why Australians have united in solidarity with Japan to express our grief at Mr Abe's passing. Many have described him 
as one of Australia's closest friends on the world stage. He visited our country five times as Prime Minister. Shinzo Abe was a statesman, a stabilising force in Japan, a giant on the world stage and a true friend to Australia. On behalf of the Australian Government and the Australian people, I again convey our sincere condolences to Mr Abe's family and to all of the people of Japan for this most terrible loss. Australia has lost a true friend and we mourn with you. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, President, I rise to support the motion of Senator Wong and to associate the Liberal and National Parties with the words and sentiments expressed by Senator Wong. Like all Australians, I was shocked and deeply saddened to hear of the shooting in Japan which would take the life of Shinzo Abe. My hopes and prayers and those of so many Australians during the hours that followed that initial news that Shinzo Abe had been injured in a shooting were sadly, on this occasion, not to be answered. And it was within just a few short hours that we heard the confirmation of our worst fears for this great leader and for our friends in Japan. Shinzo Abe was truly a giant of democratic leadership in our time. He championed values that underpin peace, progress and opportunity. He demonstrated the value of economic liberalism. Shinzo Abe was the most transformational and consequential politician of Japan's post-war era. That he has had such an impact not only on his own country but in his own region and globally is a testament to the man and his legacy, a legacy that will endure. For his life to end in a brutal act in a country that in the modern era is renowned for its peaceful democracy is an affront against so much that so many of us in Japan and in Australia hold dear. It was an affront especially to the values that Shinzo Abe espoused in thought and in deed throughout his life. It is a sad reality that Shinzo Abe's death is yet another stark reminder, if indeed one was ever needed, that nothing can be taken for granted and that the fight to defend democratic values is one that never ends. That Shinzo Abe's life should end at the hands of a coward who fired what would be fatal shots at his back whilst he was participating in the democratic process he so strongly espoused, respected and loved makes the reality of this brutal act even harder to comprehend. As Mr Dutton, the Leader of the Opposition, said in marking the tragic end of his life, Shinzo Abe was well known to Australians as a sincere, staunch and trustworthy friend. It was my pleasure to have personally met on several occasions, engaged with and to some degree uh, as part of our government-to-government -government relations worked uh, with Shinzo Abe. I recall particularly having the honour of meeting him at the Darwin Airport, one of the five visits to Australia uh, that Senator Wong referenced that he made during his time as Japanese Prime Minister. Visiting Darwin, the scene of World War II bombings in Australia, was one of those integral steps that Shinzo Abe took as part of his efforts to reconcile Japan's difficult past. By reconciling with its past, Shinzo Abe knew that Japan would be better able to more strongly embrace its future. He was clear-eyed that the deeds of one generation should not consign future generations or Japan as a whole to being a second-class or lesser global citizen. Australia should be grateful that Shinzo Abe's work, including his redefining of Japan's constitutional restrictions, has enabled Japan to step up in a bilateral sense, in a regional sense and across the world. Whether it was that engagement on the tarmac at Darwin Airport, in bilateral meetings I was privileged to be part of in Australia, Japan or Third Nations, I always found Shinzo Abe to be a warm, engaging, thoughtful but purposeful interlocutor. He made all those in the room feel like he had time for them, and he built personal connections that strengthened his status as a statesman of influence right around the globe. 
even while speaking through an interpreter. Shinzo Abe was able to promote influence and charm in the most nice and calm of ways. I recall the first bilateral meeting between uh, Shinzo Abe and then Prime Minister Morrison that occurred uh, at a G20, where, again speaking through an interpreter, part way through we realised that in referencing the Prime Minister of the day, he continually referenced Skomo-san, <laughs> picking up uh, on the Australian approach for a little bit uh, of personal engagement uh, and uh, informality. There have been many tributes played to Shinzo Abe in the days and weeks since that terrible moment on July 8, which will be etched in the collective memory of Japan forever. His achievements have rightly been well documented. As Prime Minister, he travelled to more countries than any of his predecessors, expanding the reach of his diplomacy far beyond Japan's traditional partners. He secured the US-Japan alliance even in the face of intense pressure, playing a critical role as, dare I say it, a Trump whisperer in some difficult times. He forged trade deals across the world as part of his signature ongoing economic reform agenda of Abenomics to lift Japan's economy out of two decades of stagnation, but in doing so also strengthening international cooperation with so many partners. Australia was in fact the first major developed economy with which Japan secured a free trade agreement through that era via the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement signed between Prime Minister Abe and then Prime Minister Abbott in 2014. Alongside this, he drove, as Senator Wong acknowledged, the elevation of Australia's relationship with Japan to a special strategic relationship, a phrase that I understand he reportedly coined himself. Later that year, he addressed the Australian Parliament and said that through the agreement we had deepened our economic ties and would nurture our regional and the world order to safeguard peace. In addition to the Special Purpose Agreement and Free Trade Agreement, Shinzo Abe advanced the Australia-Japan relations via commencement of the Reciprocal Access Agreement, now in force, through strengthened defence and intelligence relationships, including trilateral cooperation between Australia and the United States. Crucially, Shinzo Abe, alongside former Prime Minister Turnbull, was instrumental in saving and securing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, not once, but twice. First, following the withdrawal of the United States, and then again following the near withdrawal of Canada, ultimately seeing the conclusion and entry into force of the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership that has provided one of the two great regional trade blocks now in operation through the Indo-Pacific. Shinzo Abe knew that both our nations had the strongest possible interest in a strong and robust rules-based international order. He was a crucial architect of the Quad, a long-held ambition and one which required great persistence to bring Japan, the United States, India and Australia together in a strategic security dialogue from which Australia has benefited greatly. I would like to think that in those final months of his life, as it turned out to be, he would have taken great pride in seeing the first face-to-face -face leaders meeting take place of the Quad. And even after standing down as Prime Minister in 2020 as a consequence of the return of a health condition, Shinzo Abe remained in service to the people of Japan in the Diet and active in the democratic process, his reputation and standing growing both in Japan and globally following his retirement as Prime Minister. That his life came to an abrupt end as he was actively participating in the democratic process makes it, his passing so much harder to bear for the Japanese people, for Australia who has lost a true friend and for the world which has lost one of the great leaders of recent decades. On behalf of the coalition parties in the Senate, I send our condolences to Shinzo Abe's family, particularly his wife, Akia, and to the people of Japan. We share your shock, your dismay, your grief. 
We also share your pride in the life and achievements of one of Japan's greatest leaders and give thanks for his special connection to Australia. We reaffirm our ongoing commitment to the democratic processes to which Shinzo Abe's life and death was dedicated and to the relations between our nations and our great connection and cooperative work across our region and the world that we can build upon as part of his legacy. I thank the Senate. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. On behalf of the Australian Greens, I offer my condolences to Shinzo Abe's family, friends and the people of Japan following his unexpected and tragic death. Mr Abe served his country over many years, including two stints as Prime Minister, weathering ill health as he did so. Like the rest of the world, we felt the shock of his assassination. Mr Abe's death while campaigning was an assault on Japanese democracy, perhaps more tragic because death by gun violence is so rare in Japan. Now, those in this chamber would know that uh, Greens were quite regularly at odds with Mr Abe and the Japanese government over whaling. Senator Wish Wilson even managed to personally hand him a letter from Sea Shepherd during his visit to Australia in 2014. Senator Wish Wilson describes breaking diplomatic protocols in approaching Mr Abe, which he nonetheless graciously and respectfully received. And of course there were other issues too where we didn't see eye to eye. But none of this diminishes the shock and the pain upon hearing of his assassination. Democracy relies on elected representatives and those campaigning being available to the people. Events like this don't just hurt those close to the victim, they threaten democracy itself. I can only imagine the sadness that his death has caused his loved ones and many in his country, and I hope that the condolences of the Australian Parliament, supported by the Greens, offer some small comfort in these sad times. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Madam President, and congratulations. On behalf of the Nationals, uh, I would like to contribute to this condolence motion and associate our party, um, particularly with those comments by the Leader of the Government and the Leader of the Opposition. Um, Shinzo Abe was a man who fought for a safer, more secure region and world, a great champion of democracy, of freedom and of growing friendship between Australia and Japan. It was a great honour for all of us to be invited to the Japanese Embassy over recent weeks since um, his shocking assassination to sign a condolence book. Um, which I hope many of us took advantage of, uh, given the deep and abiding friendship between our two countries. For the Nationals, I'm not, um, the, the chronology of his life has been delivered already, um, but for the Nationals there is a deep and abiding relationship with the people of Japan that stretches more than six decades. The assassination of former Prime Minister Abe in Nara earlier this month was therefore a terrible shock but afterwards a cause for some reflection on this man's remarkable achievements as a statesman and a friend to Australia. Uh, I would like to recount the events surrounding the former country party leader's biggest political risk, John McEwen, to his career in establishing a trade deal between Australia and its former enemy, Japan, in 1957. The co-signatory to that deal was Prime Minister Kishi grandfather of the late uh, Prime Minister Abe. With the wartime memories of the prisoner of war camps in Changi and the Burma Railway still raw and real in the minds of many Australians, McEwen's diplomacy helped seal a deal that contributed to post-war prosperity for our two countries that has largely continued, albeit with some notable disruptions to the present day. But it could have been disastrous, and the Australian Prime Minister of the day was, a very, cl was very clear with the National Party leader at that time, that any downside to the deal was going to land at McEwen's feet. The wonderful historic symmetry of that deal was completed 57 years later when Prime Minister Shinzo Abe himself signed an economic partnership agreement with another Australian Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. When Shinzo Abe's time arrived, his father was also Japan's foreign minister, he was prepared to embark on his own far-reaching ambitions domestically, but also for the entire Indo-Pacific region as well. Some of his domestic efforts were successful, others not so much. Uh, Abe economic strategy to beat deflation and revive economic growth, along with introducing structural reform to cope with a fast-ageing, shrinking population. 
Abe tried to boost the country's dwindling birth rate by making workplaces more family friendly. But on the international stage, the former Japanese Prime Minister agreed to another audacious act of international diplomacy, uh, which was to commit his country to a submarine partnership with Australia. This from a former enemy country which had sent submarines into the heart of Sydney Harbour during World War II. And as we now know, Abbott and Abe submarine partnership did not eventuate, and yet another far more important legacy was secured by the late Japanese Prime Minister. Shinzo Abe was both the architect and the father of the Quad, and Australia, together with India and the US, are allies in the Quad alliance alongside Japan, a grouping that will help balance power sharing in our region over coming decades. Much has been said and much will be said about the achievements of Shinzo Abe. His lifetime of service showed each of us that our time as politicians are not merely for the present or the day-to-day -day conflicts, but that we can all be audacious and aim to leave a legacy for our nation's future. Our sympathies to his family and the people of Japan. Uh, we hope we all learn from his leadership for a more safer, peaceful uh, and prosperous world. And sometimes that means doing very brave things. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Senator Payne. Thank you, Madam President, and congratulations on your elevation to the role of uh, President. Uh, Madam President, it is important and a strong mark of respect uh, that this parliament records our sincere and shared grief at the shocking death by assassination of a faithful friend of Australia, a great leader, the former Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. I also offer my sympathies to his family, his dear wife, and to all of the people of Japan. None in Japan have so profoundly deepened the Australia-Japan relationship than Mr Abe. Ours is a relationship informed by a complex shared history. But Mr Abe did not allow those historic enmities to undermine progress between our nations. Indeed, as the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Birmingham, said, Mr Abe was the first Japanese leader to visit Darwin. Instead, he understood perfectly that our unique past was, in fact, the strongest of foundations from which to forge closer ties. Like other colleagues in this place have already mentioned, I vividly recall Mr Abe's address to a joint sitting of our parliament in July of 2014. On the cusp of signing the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement with then Prime Minister Tony Abbott, Mr Abe spoke of the example set down by his grandfather some 57 years prior recalling Prime Minister Nobusuke Kishi and Prime Minister Robert Menzies signing the Commerce Agreement, amongst the first of its kind in the post-war decades. Mr Abe didn't waste a moment. He used that same speech, welcoming the JAEPA, to outline a raft of additional economic agreements he wanted to pursue. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, and pursue it, he did the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, and he did, and Free Trade Agreement, which he also did. These agreements would be the fruit, in the words of Mr Abe, of a relationship, quote, with no limits, unquote. This encapsulated the essential character of Shinzo Abe, a boundless energy for tackling challenges and opportunities alike, a clear vision for Japan, our region and for the world, and a commanding understanding of history and how it shapes our lives. The people of Australia remain the thankful beneficiaries of Mr Abe's efforts towards trade liberalisation. In my own time as minister, I have borne close witness to the careful work of Mr Abe, including in fostering vital, closer bilateral defence cooperation with, our, with Australia. In our governments, he found a strong, and willing partner. The Japan Acquisition and Cross-Servicing Agreement, the AXA, signed in Sydney in early 2017 by Mr Abe and then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, clearly demonstrated the importance that Mr Abe placed on our special strategic partnership. Later that year, when I visited Tokyo for our annual 2 plus 2 talks, meeting with Prime Minister Abe to discuss these initiatives in the defence cooperation environment, I was struck then, and I said then, that I was left in no doubt as to Mr Abe's strong, 
personal support for our shared mission of creating a safer, more secure environment for our nations. And as the Senator of Birmingham has recorded, it was always a great pleasure and honour to meet Prime Minister Abe. Most recently, due in very large part to the leadership and work of Shinzo Abe, in January, now Japan Prime Minister Kishida and then Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison signed the vital reciprocal access agreement, which most importantly enables the ADF and the JSDF to work more closely, more cooperatively, more collaboratively on the great security challenges of our region and the globe. Madam President, underpinning our deepening security and defence relationship over these years and continuing now is Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, to which Senator Wong alluded, strongly, proudly championed by Mr Abe. This doctrine is the central organising principle for Japan's engagement in our region, and it's provided many nations with the vocabulary, if you like, required to navigate this time of strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific. It is one of the most significant contributions made by Mr Abe, not just to the safety of our region, but to the world. Mr Abe matched words with deeds. The quadrilateral security dialogue, for which Mr Abe played such a substantive role in helping to form, is a key forum through which the four like-minded democracies of Australia, the United States, Japan and India are advancing our shared vision for a free, open, inclusive uh, Indo-Pacific region. When the first in-person meeting of the Quad foreign ministers took place in New York in September 2019, this was a significant event. I took my seat with then US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Indian Minister for External Affairs Dr Jashanka, and my friend Toshi Motegi, the Japanese Foreign Minister. This was indeed an historical meeting on many levels. In very considerable part, the commitment of Shinzo Abe and his government, including of Foreign Minister Motegi, made this possible. For the Quad to have grown to leaders' meetings, virtually and in person, is an enormous contribution in strategic and security terms to our region and the globe, including through the Quad's COVID-19 support and in addressing the actions of authoritarian states that threaten that security and stability. In my view, thanks also to Shinzo Abe and subsequently his successors, Prime Minister Suga, now Prime Minister Kishida, Japan continues to make that strong and growing contribution in global security and strategic terms. Shinzo Abe reimagined the modern day JSDF. And although he did not achieve all of his goals in that respect, the enormous difference that he made will be writ large in the pages of history. Most recently, it's notable that NATO's invitation to countries of our region, Australia, New Zealand, the ROK and Japan, to first join the meeting of NATO foreign ministers in Brussels in April, which I attended, to add our voice and support to the opposition to Russia's illegal, unlawful invasion of Ukraine was the first such invitation, and indeed the first time that a Japanese foreign minister and leader subsequently had sat around the NATO table since its formation in April of 1949. I was pleased to sit around that table with Foreign Minister Yogi Hayashi. Shinzo Abe's projection of Japan in the regional and global security conversation in the military space was profound and meaningful. Given the issues that face us now as a world and as a region, it was also essential. Under his leadership, Japan was a faithful actor in many international fora, as both Senator Wong and Senator Birmingham have noted, committed to collective engagement and action. He was a decisive and consequential figure in the G7, in the G20, with ASEAN, with United, in the United Nations, and a leading voice for adherence to international rules and norms, particularly the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. 
I want to acknowledge today my many Japanese colleagues with whom I worked as minister and mark the appalling loss they have experienced in the last few weeks. I particularly acknowledge my good friends Taro Kono, Toshimitsu Motegi and Yoshimasa Hayashi, all foreign ministers of Japan and some also defence ministers of Japan uh, at, uh, as with whom I served. To Ambassador Yamagami uh, and his team here in Canberra, my sincere condolences. Madam President, the assassination of Shinzo Abe while giving a campaign speech in the pursuit of the democratic process in the city of Nara was nothing less than a wanton assault on democracy. I think most of us will never forget where we were when we heard that Shinzo Abe had been shot. The free exchange of ideas and the democratic process was tarnished badly that day, not just in Japan but to liberal democracies everywhere. That cowardly, callous, criminal act is a brutal reminder of the absolute necessity to ceaselessly safeguard democracy, safeguard freedom, safeguard the rule of law and human rights, values which Shinzo Abe championed relentlessly and in which, and which in Mr Abe's memory we must work even harder to nurture and protect. Rest in peace, Shinzo Abe, a great friend, a great leader. Thank you, Senator Payne. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, um, President. And on my first contribution in this, the 47th Parliament of Australia, can I acknowledge your uh, significant role as the President and wish you every, well, every wish in uh, the international relations that you'll be undertaking for our great nation. I also want to congratulate the Deputy President and, and all those who have assumed leadership roles in the course of their service of the Australian people through the 47th Parliament. And can I also acknowledge the incredible privilege we have as parliamentarians in this fine democracy uh, to have been elected to this Senate to do the kind of work that Shinzo Abe gave his life to. Uh, it is no small thing for us to be here, and his service and his final demise are an instruction in how fragile not only life is, but how democracy can be also uh, the severely attacked and assaulted. I speak today, Madam President, uh, on the condolence motion for the esteemed former Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. Abe was a towering leader in Japan, a political titan who was called the shadow shogun by commentators, both during his record tenure as Prime Minister and afterwards. His legacy is the shape of modern Japan, Japan and its direction for the next few decades. He was both a powerful and dedicated servant of democracy and an amazing leader of a country. Unlike uh, those who have contributed to the debate so far, who had much more personal experience of interaction with this fine man, I only saw him through his address here to the parliament. And the three words that came to mind when I thought of his contribution that day was that he was a man of incredible warmth, intelligence and humour. Uh, to that, Senator Birmingham had today added the word purposeful, and it was one that sort of resonated with me when you made that contribution, Senator Birmingham. Prime Minister Albanese has described the courage and strength of character to which Senator, uh, Senator Wong re referred, and in her contribution, I think perhaps uh, her description of him as a regional visionary is something that we should definitely dwell on. A leader in the Indo-Pacific and uh, responsible for the elevation of the Quad. Senator Payne, I think, aptly described the loss as appalling. The baffling and unprecedented nature of this assassination has led to a deep confusion and anguish amongst the Japanese and among the global admirers. As US President Joe Biden remarked on this murder, uh, it will have a profound impact on the psyche of the Japanese people, I believe, for a generation. This killing comes at a worrying time. We are seeing democracy under threat across the world, from the growing authoritarianism of leaders like Viktor Orban, the further descent of Russia under the leadership of Vladimir Putin along totalitarian paths, and the shattering 
of the US, United States Democratic consensus by Donald Trump that became manifest in the events of January 6 in the physical assault on the Capitol. Shinzo Abe positioned Japan as a linchpin of the democratic global world order and was steadfast in his support for other democracies in the face of that growing tide of opposition. He became, over his tenure, a key advocate and thought leader of a democratic internationalism adapted for the 21st century, and his murder is an untimely blow against it. His administration was a bulwark against North Korean aggression and gave assistance to those fighting the rise of ISIS. Japan, under his stewardship, became increasingly an active multilateral partner in the Indo-Pacific, leading together nearly a dozen nations which were with, with what eventually became known as the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. His influence was still powerful even following his departure from the Premiership in 2020. Experts credit his still massive influence in the government, evident in the decision by Japan to declare it would phase out Russian coal and oil imports in the face of its illegal aggression in the Ukraine. Mr Abe's vision was to shape Japan into a nation that could address the future. His first speech as president boldly stated his ambitions for his country, and I quote, my mission is none other than to draw a new vision of a nation that can withstand the raging waves for the next 50 to 100 years. All politicians might strive to declare and deliver on such a vision. Mr Abe's legacy is a revitalised democratic universal order featuring a more proactive and outward-looking Japan at its centre, a nation better able to withstand the raging waves of a tumultuous century. I am sure all of Australia and this House stands with me in thanking Mr Abe for his myriad contributions upon the world and domestic stage. I pass my deepest condolences to the family of Mr Abe and my best wishes to the government and the people of Japan as they navigate the aftermath of this tragic and senseless act. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Ban. Thank you, Madam President. I rise to pay tribute to the former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, whose time amongst us was tragically cut short by such a heinous crime. Shinzo Abe was not only Japan's longest serving post-war Prime Minister, but he was also its most consequential and had in decades, uh, and the most consequential leader Japan had had in decades, whose statecraft and wisdom transcended the islands of Japan to become a global leader. Abe-san grew from simply being Japan's leader to being a global leader, a statesman of such standing the one does not come by very often. He saw the threats to Japan and the free world as they are, not what people wish they would be. And with his citizen security and welfare in mind, he acted boldly and with confidence. During his tenure as Japan's longest serving Prime Minister, Abe-san revolutionised his nation's foreign policy by centralising the national defence system, reinterpreting the constitution to make collective defence possible and adopting an activist role in world affairs. Moreover, he devised a grand strategy for managing China's rising economic and military power more deliberately and successfully than any other world leader. One of his crowning achievements that's been mentioned is how he breathed life back into the Quad and drove it to be one of the strongest forces for stability in the Indo-Pacific. He did champion the term a free and open Indo-Pacific, something important to all Australians and peace-loving people in the region. The strength of the Quad, of integrated deterrence, of having friends is one of the key strengths that Australia has on the world stage. And this was amplified by our joining the Quad that Abe-san so ably um, help build. The legacy left by such a giant of global politics cannot be summarised in the few words I have here. However, 
We are forever grateful for his contributions to developing the Quad, a stronger Japan and a more stable Pacific. We are indebted to his sacrifice, his service and, devo and devotion to promoting democratic, democratic values across the globe. At a time of increased geopolitical upheaval, the world needs more leaders with the courage and conviction that Shinzo Abe possessed, not less. Abe-san's passing will be deeply mourned around the world. While the Japan has lost a great leader and Australia has lost a, great fr a, tr a true friend, his wisdom and global leadership will be sorely missed. I pass my condolences to the government and people of Japan, Japan and especially to His Excellency the Ambassador from Japan to Australia, uh, Shingo Yamagami. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Dep President. Uh, as Senator Wong said in her contribution on this condolence motion, uh, Mr Abe's untimely death created deep shock right around Australia. It was one of those events that I think all Australians, their attention was grabbed by. And that was, of course, partly due to the shocking nature of Mr Abe's death, something that should never happen in any society. It was partly due to Mr Abe's genuine stature as a real national leader. And I think it was also partly due to the deep, long-term, sustained relationship between our two countries. And that's what I want to focus my brief remarks on in this condolence motion, especially in relation to the portfolio that I have the great privilege now of representing, the portfolio of agriculture. Australia's agriculture relationship with Japan is one of our strongest and most highly developed in the Indo-Pacific region. Our trade with Japan in agriculture is extremely strong. And in fact, Japan is our biggest market for beef and cheese, and our farmers are strongly committed to supplying to Japan and want to maintain and increase market share. We have deep and long-standing ties in agriculture. Japan is one of Australia's largest and most valued trading partners, as it has been for more than five decades. And this relationship has underpinned the broader relationship between our two countries, as is evident in trade more generally, in national security and in people-to-people -people links. Now, the reason I mentioned that in this condolence motion was Prime Minister Abe's mm. integral role in forging and strengthening those links. Prime Minister Abe, has, as has been noted by a number of speakers, was a true friend to Australia. Under his prime ministership, our bilateral relationship was upgraded to a special strategic partnership in 2014. By 2015, we had signed the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement, or JEPA, which underpins our economic relationship and supports our broader cooperation on economic security and the prosperity of the Indo-Pacific. Prime Minister Abe was a reformer, and he had a vision for the Japanese economy. As has been noted, he was known for his signature Abenomics policy. And this included agricultural reforms in which his government made small but important reforms to the Japanese agriculture sector, focusing on competitiveness and exports. We share similar goals to Japan in growing our agriculture industries. Japan is looking to grow agriculture exports in the same way that our agriculture industry wants to expand its farm gate returns as well. And again, Mr Abe can take credit for the fact that bilaterally we continue to increase our cooperation on food value chains and to co collaborate with Japan on activities that strengthen global agriculture supply chains. Multilaterally, Japan has been a like-minded partner in many forums, including the G20, APEC and the UN, as well as a leading proponent of trade agreements, including the CPTPP. And again, Mr Abe can take personal credit for much of that. The other reason I wanted to speak in this motion, apart from my role as the new Agriculture Minister for our country, is that I wanted to speak on a personal level as someone who's had a long-term interest in and friendship with Japan. I studied Japanese at school a very long time ago, uh, or should I say, boku wa gakko de nihongo o benkyo shimashita. 
Um, and I was reflecting on this. Um, there's not much more to my Japanese knowledge or, or <laughs> that I've recalled from my school days. Um, but I was reflecting on this in preparing these notes, and I remember that the reason, more than any, that I studied J Japanese of all the languages that were off on offer at my school was that at that point in time, the mid-1980s, when I was starting high school, I think Australia was really coming to understand exactly how important Japan was to our future. And there was a really big push uh, for students in high schools to study Japanese at school. Uh, and it's something that I really enjoyed. Uh, and I might say it was one of my better subjects at school um, because I did really enjoy it. And, I, and it really gave me a deep interest in Japan, its history, its culture, <laughs> and its relationship to our own country. I also had the privilege of visiting Japan uh, as part of a delegation of uh, federal and state uh, aspiring politicians shortly before I started in this place. Uh, and I was accompanied on that delegation by Senators Dean Smith and Bridget McKenzie, uh, which is probably the reason that despite our political differences uh, and our, our tendency to uh, trade blows, we're actually pretty good mates. And I put it down to that uh, delegation that we undertook uh, to Japan, along with a number of other MPs as well. And that visit confirmed to me, through the meetings that we had with uh, government, uh, industry and other officials in Japan, it confirmed to me the enduring strength of our two countries' relationship. Mr Abe's untimely death is an extremely sad blow to the Japanese people. We grieve with them, and I sincerely pass on my condolences to Mr Abe's family, his friends and the Japanese people at large. In closing, I might just say, Kono tabe wa okuyami moshi agemasu. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Farrell. Uh, I wish to associate my comments to those of uh, um, Minister Watt and uh, just um, indicate the sadness uh, in uh, former Prime Minister Abe's um, very untimely death. But I would like to um, acknowledge and welcome the uh, presence in the chamber of uh, Ambassador and uh, uh, Mrs uh, Yamagami. And on behalf of the Australian Senate, uh, I extend our sincerest condolences to you as the representative to Australia of the government and the people of Japan. Thank you, Senator Farrell. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. Thank you. The motion is carried. So we just deal with messages from the 46th Parliament. Messages from the previous Parliament have been received from the House of Representatives and indicated on today's dynamic read. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to 23 laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. And I believe there's some committee memberships. So the president has received letters nominating senators to be members of committees. I call the minister. Thank you. And uh, as this is the first uh, time I've um, had the opportunity to congratulate you on your you. um, well-deserved uh, appointment to this uh, new role, and uh, I wish you all the very success um, in it. Uh, but I do seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators uh, to committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Thank you, uh, <coughs> President. Um, I move that senators be appointed to committees in accordance with the letters circulated in the chamber. Thank you. And uh, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Farrell be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. 
I have received letters from party leaders nominating senators to fill vacancies on three statutory committees. Minister. Um, thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to statutory authorities. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister. Thank you, uh, President. Um, I move that senators be appointed to statutory authorities as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, minister, are you seeking? Oh, I'm not sure if we've finished with. Have we voted? We've finished. Yes, we have. So I'm have giving you the call, minister. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the next uh, meeting of the uh, Senate. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. I move that the Senate meet on Wednesday, the 27th of July, 2022. Thank you, Minister. The Senate stands adjourned till Oh, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Farrell be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe that's carried. And were you seeking the call again? Yes, I am. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, what am I saying? That's all right. It's all new. Christ. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing were, all right, wasn't I? It's all right. All I had to Senator do was follow Watt the instructions. Set a very bad example there. <laughs> But, yeah, he did. But go um, on, Minister. I move that the Senate now do adjourn. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Farrell be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe that's carried. And the Senate stands adjourned till 9.30 a.m. tomorrow. Thank you, Senators. That's all. No, Murray led off with that.